in before we get started. Great to see you all. Um, hope you can hear me okay. Welcome back for those of you rejoining our Recovery Science uh, webinar series. For those of you who are here for the first time, warm welcome to you all. Happy lunchtime. Thanks for joining us this lunchtime. Um, and uh, just so you know, we will be um, recording this um, and it will be archived for future use and viewing. Uh, so please let others know that this is available uh, if they weren't able to make it today and share the content please widely. Uh, we obviously want to maximize uh, the benefits of uh, this presentation so that other people can benefit who couldn't make it. So thank you for being here. Um, this is, I think, I forget what number this is, but maybe number 20 or roughly so in our series of um, webinars on the topic of um, uh, recovery support services and science um, that is sponsored jointly by SAMHSA, the Opioid Response Network, and the Recovery Research Institute. Um, before we get going, uh, we just want to play a, a very brief uh, one-minute video um, that explains a little bit about the Opioid Response Network um, that Maya is going to play for us. Maya, would you be so kind as to play it? address opioid and stimulant use and the overdose crisis. You can't overcome this alone, but we can, together, and we are. We are the Opioid Response Network, a coalition of 40 national organizations representing more than 2 million people. We serve all 50 states and nine territories locally through our network of nearly 1,000 professionals working across prevention, treatment, and recovery. For state agencies, organizations big and small, and individuals working to address local needs. We bring training and education to bear on your efforts. We're here to help you help others through evidence-based support, all at no cost to you. For instance, the Opioid Response Network helped the Tribal College in New Mexico join forces with local organizations to develop a culturally appropriate prevention, treatment, and recovery training series for its students. In Rhode Island, we convened correction staff from 34 states to share how our program had reduced post-incarceration overdose deaths by more than 60% and supported them in their efforts to build similar programs in their home states. In West Virginia, we mobilized to help a clinic incorporate substance use disorder services into their practice, serving a faith-based community. We helped healthcare providers in South Dakota address barriers they face providing treatment services for their patients. We're here to help those on the front lines. So what are your needs and how can we help? Visit the opioidresponsenetwork.org to learn more and to submit a request for support. The Opioid Response Network, funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Communities across. Great, um, that's enough. <laughs> Um, great. Um, thanks, Maya. Hopefully that'll put you in the picture. The nice thing about the Opioid Response Network um, uh, via federal funding through SAMHSA, um, it provides free consultation and technical assistance. Um, so please let people know uh, your, yourself. Of course, you can go to the ORN, opioidresponsenetwork.org. Uh, you can sign up for training, consultation. It's all free, uh, courtesy of uh, taxpayer dollars through the federal government. Um, in, in an attempt to, of course, to address the opioid crisis, as well as other substance use disorders. So please let people know. Um, and um, as you can see here, in terms of our webinar series um, that we've been doing now for a while, uh, we've had a number of different uh, topics that we've presented on. Um, we have all these archived, so please you know, avail yourself of these past uh, uh, webinars uh, on our website. And uh, next slide. And uh, today we're very fortunate uh, to, to have another great webinar, uh, a very uh, distinguished speaker, Dr. Lenny Jason, who's really been uh, kind of a leader for many decades in this area. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Jason. He's currently a professor of psychology at DePaul University and the director of the Center for Community Research 
He's edited uh, or written 30 books. He's published over 900 articles um, and 100 book chapters in areas such as recovery homes for those with substance use disorders, tobacco use prevention, violence prevention, and prospective and epide epidemiological studies of post-viral illnesses. In addition to serving on the editorial boards of 10 psychological journals, he has also served on review committees at the National Institutes of Health and has received nearly $50 million of funding in his, in his career so far. Um, so just absolutely delighted to have uh, Dr. Jason with us, his expertise and viewpoint uh, to bring to bear on this um, recovery support service, recovery home. So Lenny, I'll pass it over to you. And uh, if you have questions, um, uh, please make a note. You can put them in the chat also. And hopefully we'll have time at the end to, to have some Q&A with, with Dr. Jason and to have some discussion. So Lenny, over to you to share your screen. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with this important opioid response network. And I hope to, in my brief presentation, talk to you a little bit about recovery homes, um, which are, as you all know, in every city, community, state, through the country. After treatment for substance use disorders, many patients return to high-risk environments. And as we all know, returning to these sense, these types of settings can increase chances of relapse. I've been fortunate to working with a group called Oxford House for many decades. Um, this is a grassroots movement, now over 3,000 Oxford houses around the country. Um, they serve over 25,000 people. They are self-run without professional staff. People who live in these houses um, cannot take substances, um, although MATs are actually available. I'll talk more about that. Um, they need to pay their fair share um, of rent, um, maybe $120, $130 a week, and then follow the rules of the house. Um, in our current cost-conscious environment, it represents a inexpensive and potentially effective setting promoting abstinence. Um, I might add that there's also other types of recovery homes, of course, um, that have staff um, or individuals that own them. Um, and altogether, we're talking about several hundred thousand people every year um, living in recovery homes um, by our best estimate. This is um, what these recovery homes look like. Um, these are particularly Oxford houses. You can see um, they're, they look like any other house um, and they're situated in all types of neighborhoods. And the hope is that they're situated in places where um, there's less potential um, possibilities of um, getting um, use going again. So they try not to put them in areas that um, are kind of um, have lots of risk factors. This is uh, one male house. Um, the houses are either male or female. And as you can see, um, all different types of folks kind of in these houses. And it looks like any other house on the block. Sometimes people have asked kind of, do Oxford houses blend in with the community? And in one study, we found that the Oxford house residents spent about 10 and a half hours per month on neighborhood involvements. And these included 44% in administering and running support groups, but other things as well. Um, for example, um, over half were involved in educating the community about Oxford houses and 36% were involved in educating the community on recovery in general. And most interesting, when we asked um, those who live there, do you think living in your Oxford house increased your likelihood of involvement in your neighborhood? 86% answered yes. So these individuals can be very good neighbors um, for the community. And actually the place on the block that um, has a very democratic way of governing um, and also has individuals in it who are not using or abusing substances. 
very early on, we um, worked on an outcome study um, and we wanted to find out, first question is, does it work? And really we needed to do a randomized design um, to, to sort of test that out of taking individuals and putting them either into um, a recovery home or not, and then following them up and seeing whether it actually had an effect. So that was our first, we, we really struggled with this for a number of years, whether we could do it. Um, but Paul Malloy convinced us that it was possible. And if we brought a person to one recovery home and they weren't accepted, um, we would take them to a second. And um, people who were just completing substance use treatment were in the study. They were randomly assigned to either an Oxford House or usual care condition. Um, and of 154 individuals we approached to be in the study, 150 agreed. And all the ones who we sent to an Oxford House were ultimately accepted. So we actually had 75 in an Oxford House and 75 who did not get an Oxford House. Um, we interviewed the individuals every six months for two years, four waves of data collection. And across the 24 month assessment, um, we kept within the Oxford House condition, 89% of participants in usual care, 86%. And that's pretty good data over time um, for these um, high risk samples. The outcomes were very encouraging um, compared to usual care group. Um, they had higher abstinence rates, 69% versus 35% without the recovery homes, higher monthly income, $989 versus $440, and lower incarceration rates, 3% versus 9%. Um, and as you can see, um, almost twice the abstinent rates um, for Oxford House participants. And incarceration rates were lower for the Oxford House and um, monthly income. When people were making about $1,000 a month, they're beginning to kind of transition out of that very high risk poverty status, um, particularly when they're in a setting that's inexpensive and they're surrounded by people who are working, um, which again, reduces the likelihood that they're going to get into trouble with illicit, illicit activities. Our study got published all over the country um, and uh, we're very happy to see the publicity. Um, this particular study that occurred um, ultimately helped SAMHSA um, become, and awarded it a um, designation of an empirically validated program. And again, having a randomized um, study um, was important in getting that particular approval. This was, uh, again, about 20 years ago. Um, in addition, this particular research helped um, get connected with the judicial system and, and other systems as well. In, in one particular case, um, we had a, a judge and a lawyer um, was basically dealing with um, the NIMBY, not in my backyard phenomena. And they basically had a rule saying if you had five or more unrelated people, they would not let the people start a recovery home or they tried to terminate the recovery home. That's one of the strategies that's sometimes used. Um, the lawyer defending the Oxford House called me and said, do we have information about people in Oxford houses in terms of, is it better to have more people than less? And we looked at our data set and we run the numbers and we actually found out if you had um, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 people in an Oxford house versus four or five, um, you actually had better outcomes from our data. And we actually wrote this up and eventually published it. And, um, and because of that particular um, finding, we've actually had that particular um, research help in a number of judicial court cases. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been a court case that has gone against those particular findings. Um, one of the most uh, spectacular situations was when a, um, a lawyer called me, said, do you have anything on this issue of how many people in a house? Because they're trying to close down this Oxford house um, for too many people in it. And uh, I sent them the study and they had been arguing this case for many months. 
and the lawyer showed it to the judge. And in that afternoon, um, the judge ruled for the Oxford House. The case got dismissed. So within one day, um, they basically were able to settle on this particular case. Um, so that was very gratifying to see actually research um, making a difference. We've also had research conducted on tolerance. Sometimes people have asked us, does it make a difference if you're living with uh, other individuals for something other than kind of substance use? Um, and yes, um, we have found that tolerance trajectories over time um, actually um, increased when where people were in these Oxford houses. And these results support the claim that residents of communal living settings when they have a superordinate goal, everyone working together to overcome substance abuse problems, um, we actually see um, more tolerance occurring. And I'll never forget the individual who came up to me at an Oxford House convention and said, um, you know, you're studying all these types of things that we're doing that's good, which is, you know, we're not using substances and you know, we're doing more positive things in our community, but you really need to study us and then he pointed to a woman who was at the convention he said, see that woman over there, she's my girlfriend. And I would never have even talked to her before because she's HIV positive. And I had a lot of biases and I would discriminate against all types of people. And living in an Oxford house really taught me to understand um, differences are good. Um, and now I'm much more tolerant and you need to study this. And actually that was the idea for this particular study. Um, we came back to our lab with that input and we did the study and we actually found that he was absolutely right in terms of the research. Some of the work that we've been doing over the last decade is looking at social networks. And the reason we started this work was that we found that if you had a house resident who was a friend and one person you could call a friend, you were less likely to leave the house. And if you stayed in the house for six months, you were less likely to have um, a problem of relapse. So we said, well, gee, friendship is something we need to study. Um, and in one of our data sets, um, we had 207 individuals released from jail or prison, um, and they were re recruited from inpatient treatment centers in Chicago um, before the last day of treatment. And this is just a sample of five of those individuals that I wanna share with you some of the social network um, beginning efforts that we made. We were looking at ego networks of five women who reported high risk HIV behavior. And this was needle sharing with heroin use and prostitution. And the ego of the persons, the resident um, the individuals average age was 38, they were African-American. They had seven convictions an average of two years spent in the criminal justice system. And this is our wave one and wave five. Again, wave one, wave five is two years later. And the number of alters, it means people you're connected with increase from five to seven. So you have a larger social network. Most importantly, heroin users went from 4.3 to 1.67. So less heroin users in your network and family members went from 33% to 47% to the network. So again, prominent changes and this is an, just an example of an early social network analysis. This was wave one when they entered in Oxford House. This is wave five, two years later. These are people from the criminal justice system. And these red dots are the nodes or individuals. This is the ego, the person. And you can see the red are people who are actually um, users. Um, and basically, you can see that these individuals, this person is surrounded by users. Um, and yet kind of two years later, living in a sober living environment, um, now the people around them are basically very few users. Only a friend and a brother are still users. Um, so the person has changed what's called the people, places, and things. Um, and that's what social networks, that's the power of trying to understand this. And ultimately, we developed a social network instrument. It looks at types of relationships from friends to adversaries, mentoring, going to a person for advice and trust how much money you would lend the person or resources. 
and the ratings go from um, friendship, close friendship to adversary. And we have a good Kronbach alpha 0.85 and a multi-level confirmatory factor analysis, good fit. And this is what it looks like statistically. And so our first study, we examined um, five Oxford House recovery homes, um, wave one and then three months later. And we began using, with help of John Light, who's a um, sociologist, Oregon Research Institute, something called stochastic actor-oriented model. And this helps us understand social networks as a set of individuals who have relationships that evolve over time. And one person can affect another and that person can get affected again. So it, it looks at reciprocal relationships, not just unidimensional relationships. And this is some, again, early example of, um, this is during kind of wave one, this is wave three. And you can see that trust um, is basically each, you can see the dots are the persons and the lines are connections. And uh, it's maybe a little bit hard to see that, but um, trust is about mutual in about 16 to 20% of cases. So if you trust someone, they trust you back. Um, so that's kind of an indication of some mutuality, but confidant relationships is a little bit less. Um, so in a sense, if you're confident with someone, that person might not be confident back. So this is an element of role specification. It's designated listener does not generally confide in the other person. Um, it's a little bit hard to see that all, but this is kind of what it was telling us. And just again, some information that we got was that a greater level of trust predicted a greater probability of forming a confident relationship. Um, individuals who engaged in more 12-step activity were more likely to trust others and length of health residents made an individual more likely to be trusted. So um, these are some other results that we found. Um, when do we trust our housemates? If your ho Oxford house adopts AA related attitudes and behaviors, you're more likely to trust them. If you participate in 12 step activities, you're more likely to trust them. And when do we confide in our housemates? When you trust a member resident, you're more likely to choose that member as a confidant and members that are either a confidant, com confider or a confidant, but generally not both. So next step was we began um, a little bit more sophisticated analysis looking at, and this is, it turns out a Squamish tribe outside of Seattle, um, which had a male house and a female house. And this is the male house. And this is some of the dimensions that we assess um, and again, one of the key things is reciprocity. Does the relationship go back and forth for two people? And density, these are just some of the things that social networks can allow you to look at. Um, and here's an example. Every person asks everyone else, how friendly are you with this person? So this is what's called a whole network. And everyone rates, um, am I a close friend, a friend, an acquaintance, stranger, adversary, and with each person. And if you're a close friend or friend, we make that the threshold for having a friendship. And this is kind of a house. This is on the Squamish tribe. And the arrows, you can see they can go both ways. And these are individuals. And these are the arrows. And this is what a social network map looks like. And you can see there's just a tremendous amount um, of connections. Um, being confidant, we kind of say, how often do you go to this person for advice on your recovery and other important life? issues. And if you mark very often or quite often, then we call that a tie, or that's a connection of being a confidant. And this is, again, the same individuals. And you can sort of see um, some of them go back and forth, but confidants usually are one way. Um, one, one, one person to the other is the confidant. Um, and then providing tangible resources. If a person asks to borrow money from you, how much would you be willing to lend them? If you're willing to lend them 50 or 100 or $500, we consider that a tie. That's something uh, we say that's, that means you're really willing to give that person quite a lot. And again, these are networks and you can see it's pretty dense. Individuals are really sharing a lot of resources with each other on this tribe. These are some of the indices that we get out. It's a little bit, don't have really time to go into all this, but you can see that um, 
there's lots of data that you can get from these simple questions um, about um, characteristics of that network. So here's some of the findings from this particular house. Um, we found that a well-integrated social network of Oxford House residents um, by examining these central um, characteristics. And this recovery home on the Squamish Tribe provided its residents with multiple sources of friendship, trust, and confidence. So, so what we then did was we collected data from 42 Oxford houses every four months for two years. Um, and wave one included 55% males and 45% females and mean age of 38 years. And the average length of stay in the Oxford house was about 10.3 months, averaging from seven days to 6.8 years. And um, in this study that we've finished, um, we also developed a measure of the psychological sense of community. So we're interested in networks and how it relates to kind of people's sense of community in these homes. And we developed a nine item questionnaire um, that has good psychometric properties. And three theoretical factors emerged um, involving the self, interactions with others, membership and the organization entity. And again, we're happy to make that available and it's actually on my website if anybody's interested to see a copy of this. And again, it's free to be used. All the measures that we have at DePaul, we provide at no charge to anyone. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, you either, um, each of these items is filled out. I think this E entity, Oxford House is a good Oxford House, um, but these are the questions. Um, three, six, nine, very simple. And you can see um, that there's really three domains um, and there's one overall domain. So what have we found for this particular measure? Um, sense of community and trust, trust as measured by the social networks, sense of community by our sense of community measure. These are ecological aspects of recovery home or any setting that has important influence on hope. An individual tends to value trust relationships if they're engaged. And the sense of community self factor was the best predictor of hope. What that means is that an individual's personal investment in their house community is related to their hopefulness in terms of goal attainment and opportunities. So hope and sense of community were strong predictors of quality of life in these re recovery homes and supporting contextual as well as individual characteristics is a possible influence on recovery trajectories. Um, and impo an important function of recovery residence is the creation of a sense of community. And again, I think as um, you know, psychologists and mental health professionals, I think we sometimes get a little bit more focused on individuals um, individual characteristics. Um, there's nothing wrong with hope and self-efficacy, self-esteem, um, but I think we also need to understand the system level resources or competency-based interventions. What does a system provide individuals? And sometimes um, some of our research suggests that systems are, are so pervasive and important that they almost overwhelm kind of individual characteristics. So here's an example of some of the work that we have done and found, and that is the quality of life of an individual living in recovery homes is connected with their hope, their house sense of community, and other individual level predictors. Um, those are all important in terms of quality of life, but um, that house sense of community is very important. Now, we've also done some work with um, MATs over the last um, number of years. And we actually started this work um, almost um, seven years ago um, with Oxford Houses. So 10 years ago, um, Oxford Houses would not let anyone in with MATs, medication-assisted therapies. Um, and we did some work in 
some houses on the East Coast, and we found that the majority of residents were not receiving MAT, so though 32% actually reported histories of using some MAT, so that was uh, interesting. But in general, um, about 2016, um, you know, six, seven years ago, um, there were actually mostly negative attitudes regarding MATs among the residents, um, particularly those who were not receiving MATs. And those who were receiving MATs reported mixed attitudes regarding their use of MATs in Oxford houses. So, so this was a study that we did it with uh, John Major, who's at Truman College, and, and some of um, our students. What's interesting is that um, a couple years later, when we also kind of looked at um, recovery homes, Oxford houses, we found no differences in terms of abstinence rates, involvement in 12-step groups, or previous MAT treatments between residents utilizing or not utilizing MATs. Um, and residents living with others who were utilizing MATs reported actually more favorable attitudes than residents who were not living with such residents. Um, and that was observed only among residents whose primary drug of choice involved opioids. And in another study, um, we examined the relationship between psychiatric severity, individuals who had comorbid psychiatric illness, for example, and stress among persons using MATs. Um, and what we found in the study was that social networks within recovery homes reduce the effects of psychiatric severity and stress for residents who use MAT, MATs when they live with others who also use MATs. So if I could summarize kind of what's happened, um, and this is our latest research done by Arturo Soto Navarez, um, where he did a qualitative analysis of eight people um, who were on MATs living in Oxford houses. Um, and four themes emerged from this qualitative um, interpretative phenomenological analysis that um, involved recovery process, managing logistics, personal development and familial values. Um, and in overall, if I could summarize what Arturo found is that individuals prescribed MATs said they benefited from living in an Oxford house in order to manage their recovery as well as to stay compliant with their medication for two interesting findings. And the other thing that we found, which was interesting, is that the attitudes um, of people who were actually um, living in Oxford houses has changed dramatically. And in 2022, 2023, um, what we find is um, most Oxford house recovery homes are actually welcoming people with MATs, which was not the case. Um, six, seven years ago. So there's been a landscape um, difference, which is, uh, I think, a very positive development so that everyone has a chance um, if they're living with um, in Oxford houses. So let me try to kind of summarize um, this uh, presentation um, by kind of what I think the takeaway messages are, and then I'll hopefully have some time to uh, field some of your questions. Um, we've been really looking at the mechanisms through which social environments affect health outcomes. I mean, looking at system level evolutions. Um, you know, we started our work by first saying, does it work? It seemed like the initial findings were that, um, yes, there was a benefit to these Oxford houses in helping people in recovery. The next step was, we wanted to sort of understand why it worked. What are the mechanisms? And our research, we hoped, would contribute to reducing healthcare costs um, by reducing the, improving the effectiveness of these residential recovery home systems. Um, and also by restructuring and improving other community-based recovery settings, there could be lessons learned um, in these settings that could have enormous effects. And what we have concluded from our many years of working with these recovery homes is that um, they are low cost, but potentially effective ways of 
replacing social networks. So if you coming out of jail or prison and you end up going back into a social network that's dominated by people who are using alcohol and drugs and engaged in illegal activities, um, those are draws that are going to push one into those particular behaviors again. But if you can find a way of putting yourself into a context where people are working, people are not abusing, using alcohol and drugs, and, and whether they're employed and not doing illegal activities, you give that person a platform of a beginning effort to change um, very dramatic ways of being in this world um, and give them a chance at recovery. Settings that have ecological variables that instill hope are really what we need to understand. Um, and just like there's different families and some families are better at instilling hope for their children than others, that's the same way with recovery homes. Um, we need to understand, um, you know, what is it about really effective recovery homes? If you have a really well-managed effective recovery home, we have found, and you can put people with all types of risk statuses in it, and they generally have good outcomes. If you have a recovery home that's not, um, doesn't have those attributes, and you put people in it who are shaky, um, they're going to have difficulties, although those who are brought into even shaky recovery homes who have good starting off recovery factors generally do okay. So the person environment fit is critical for us to understand. But we still need to know why is it that um, within the first month or two, um, you have almost half the people in recovery homes who leave. Um, now some of them leave because they have just better opportunities, but quite a few of them don't make it in these recovery homes. So we think they're effective, but we also know that only about 50% are gonna make it through those first critical months. And if you can stay in there for six months, um, that's the key marker of having a better trajectory for success. But we need to understand why is it that some individuals seem to come in and follow the rules, make friends and do well, and others basically don't. And I think that's a challenge that we need to understand better. Um, so hope, we believe, is a component of successful recovery. How do we instill? How do we maintain? How do we enhance hope? And research is needed that will provide insight on within how structures and dynamics as predictors of an individual's likelihood of maintaining a positive recovery trajectory. So in summary, community-based solutions um, include recovery homes and, and all the other things that um, you, know, you folks are um, hearing on these different um, webinars, um, how individuals can seek support for others. Um, and mutual health systems like Oxford House Recovery Homes, we think can facilitate access to larger supportive networks where people make new friends, know each other, interact regularly, intimately to promote a new lifestyle that promotes altruism. Thank you. Lenny, thank you. That was just fantastic. Just really nice overview of kind of the effectiveness, efficacy and mechanisms so far um, that you've been able to uncover you and others. It's just really fascinating. And it's nice to see, you know, kind of a lot of overlap between other kinds of mechanisms research that's been done in terms of you know, so-called social ecological, social climate uh, aspects, as well as other kinds of indices of change that have been uh, looked at in mutual health organizations, for example. Um, so thank you for that. Now, before we get into questions, um, I forgot to do something at the beginning, <laughs> uh, which is just to ask you to fill out, please, fill out just the demographic um, uh, measure that we capture at every beginning of every webinar. My apologies, so just take a minute and then we can get into the Q&A. Here it is. And there's just one, um, one question as well um, on the uh, kind of content question of to, uh, surrounding today's talk. So just please take a minute just to fill this out and submit. Thank you. You can scroll down as well 
to look at the other questions. Could someone run that again, please? Uh, I, I missed it. Um, the, you missed the poll? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you do that again, Maya, or not? Um, unfortunately, I don't think we can rerun the poll, but it might still be um, lurking around in your um, desktop somewhere. It will be um, a pop up outside of this Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully you can find that. If not, don't worry. Um, I think it was Adam who asked, asked that. Don't worry, Adam, if you can't find it. If you can, great, please, please do it and submit. Uh, I know we've got a number of questions were popping up all through your presentation, uh, Lenny. Uh, one question I had just in terms of the size of the Oxford houses, is there kind of an optimal size number of residents, which is kind of a, a, a threshold for kind of therapeutic aspects or, or is or is there you know is there is is there a too many kind of scenario and too little is there a sweet spot a mommy bear kind of sweet spot yes i think i think there is um if you have too few people what happens is the expense um becomes higher so if you have just three or four people um it's going to be more expensive for each individual and you have less opportunities to learn from each other. Um, and in these these recovery homes, actually they distribute different jobs. There's a president, there's a controller, you know, they, they, the secretary. So the more roles you have, the more opportunities you get to have in leadership and participate. Um, if you have seven to 10 people, um, that's pretty good. Some of the houses have used my findings to recommend um, much larger um types of recovery homes so when you get into 50 75 100 200 there's actually been people who have used some of the findings that i published and said well larger is better so let's just make them as large as possible but i think you've got real losses then because what happens is um you don't get those like like a family that really you kind of care about you get to know um you're in a large large group um, and sometimes you have more difficulties enforcing the rules too, um, when people are using or abusing. Um, so I do think that if you can keep them like a family, uh, an extended family, um, seven to 10, um, you can go up a little bit higher, you go a little bit lower, but you know, as soon as you get into much larger, um, yeah, um, minimum of six up to 11. So I think, uh, you know, Carrie has said it right. That's really I think that is the spot that you, you want to try to get your recovery homes. Kind of the sweet spot. Good to know. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, questions, comments. Uh, Maya, do we have some in the chat that you can pitch to 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 Lenny? Yes, absolutely. And um, we have a lot of great comments in the chat. Um, one question that comes up, um, somebody asked, how long do people remain participating in this program? So it's it's interesting that it's really um, self-selecting. So um, we've actually known people uh, who have been in there for many years um, and it's really their home and it's their community and they want to be connected with it. And, and sometimes um, there's like kind of like a, a graduating class of people who sort of say, well, we, we really maybe want to just have maybe four people in a um, house. Um, so yes, so sometimes they'll even kind of branch out into a very a smaller group that seems to work well. They've known each other a lot. Um, but I would say if, again, the key issue is, will people stay in the house for six months? Um, and that's the key issue. You know, if you can get people to stay in that house for six months and and live with all, it's like you're in a fishbowl and you have all these people watching you and giving you feedback. And can you sort of withstand that type of suggestions and, and actually feedback about a lot of behaviors 
that you know used to. Um, let me just give you an example. Um, a gentleman kind of visited um, my center uh, two weeks ago, and um, from the recovery home community, and he was in his early thirties, um, and he talked to our team, and you know we sort of you know he said you know um, I'm doing great now. Um, he said that uh, um, he had um, HIV, and once he had HIV, um, he couldn't do the types of drugs he did before, um, and uh, so he knew he had to kind of change his life. Um, but what he said was, he said, when I went into an Oxford house for the first time, it was people telling me what to do who were not, in a sense, my bosses. It was my peers, and I could hear that. And that was the difference. And, and he couldn't hear that message of stuff he was doing that was messing up um, when it was basically authority figures. He rebelled against that. But when he had people who were telling him, you've got to you know, get the lint out of the laundry room. You've got to put the stuff away. You've got to, you can't leave things messy <laughs> because if you do those things, there's consequences and you're actually fined. Um, so you have to, it's like, it's very, it's like contingency management if you um, have a kind of a behavioral point of view. So, so that's why, um, yeah, so you can live in this for the rest of your life if you want. Um, and as a comment just mentioned, that, that's the amazing thing about, um, you know, this invention um, that Paul Malloy and others um, actually in 1975 started. Um, and it's, uh, um, and Paul Malloy passed away. Some of you probably might have heard that um, this last year, but uh, he was, uh, you know, an incredible figure in the recovery community. Um, but yeah, kind of as long as you want to stay there, um, you stay there. If you're ready to leave, you leave. Um, and as long as your peers kind of feel okay about you and feel that, you know, you're part of your good, your citizen and good standing, um, it, it could be permanent housing. And the nice thing about it is if you're, if you're paying your rent <laughs> and if you're paying your bills and if you're a good citizen um, and if you're working, I mean, what else do you want? I mean, basically, um, and you're contributing to your community. Um, boy, those are uh, incredible recovery stories. Great. Other other questions, Maya? Okay. Yeah, we had a um, a couple questions circling around the same theme, which is um, how is a recurrence of use handled in the house? So, if if a person is um, kind of using, um, they they have to leave, um, and. Um, and again, it's, you know, often there's some efforts made to get the person into like recovery um, setting where they can kind of go into detox um, or go to, you know, basically, and they can, they can come back. Um, and, they, and actually, it's interesting, you know, when I talk to our recovery home members, sometimes it takes a couple kind of cycles. Um, they try it, it doesn't work, but they say this was something that was useful and they can make an effort to come back to that house or a different house. By the way, when you come into a house, you have to um, get accepted by the house members. So the majority of the house members, um, you know, actually have to um, agree to you coming back in. Um, so, so it's like any family. Um, and, and it's interesting, when you apply to come into an Oxford house, it does not matter what you've done in the past. There's nothing, nothing that you could have done in the past that can stop you from getting into an Oxford house. I mean, nothing. Um, and, and you have a clean slate if you're willing to say you're going to change your life. And if they feel that you're sincere about changing your life, whether you've murdered someone, whether you've been an arsonist, it doesn't matter. If you're ready to change, they will allow you a, an opportunity. And, and, and truthfully, um, that's pretty unusual um, in our society to give anybody, um, you know, that type of chance. Um, someone asked a question about, you know, what is it about, you know, so many people not making it? Well, um, what happens is some people, um, you have like a couple of weeks to find a job. So some people, um, you know, they're just not interested in working um, or it's very difficult to find a job. And after three weeks, 
or four weeks, um, the house is going to say, we can't keep keeping you. You know, you've got to work. But the nice thing about Oxford House is that people are working at lots of jobs. So they can take you with you to an employment setting so that you can sort of start kind of working someplace. So it's almost like having like social workers in the house who are helping you find that first job. Um, but if you can't get work and you can't pay your bills, you're not going to be able to live there. Um, also, if you're not willing to follow the rules, in general, if you get like, you know, fines, for example, um, and you're not doing things that the rule, you know, the, the Oxford House, they set up lots of rules and each house kind of says, you know, you have to be a person in good standing. Um, for example, once a week, there's a business meeting. Are you going to the business meeting? Well, if you don't go to the business meeting, um, that's a problem. Or if you don't do the other things that they ask you to do. So if you, if you consistently do not do things, you'll be put on a contract. One example is if, if you start social isolating, they kind of figure social isolating is generally a risk factor for relapse. So they'll say you can't social isolate. You have to spend more time in the living room with others. Um, they'll put you on a contract. Um, so those contracts and those behavioral efforts to bring about change don't work. Um, the person eventually is going to feel um, not welcome. If the person isn't able to make a friendship, <laughs> so important to have a friend, just to have someone who you can sort of talk to and can, and if it's reciprocal, that's even better. Um, but if you can't make a friend in the house, um, that's probably going to be a predictor of um, not being successful. But truthfully, these are just guesses. Um, I really wish I had more data to help me understand um, because if we can figure out like why is it that some people aren't making it and some people are, you know, we have a better chance of maybe trying to, you know, help houses um, take care of that problem. Um, and by the way, just another interesting, very interesting finding is that it turns out that African Americans seem to stay longer in Oxford houses than people who are not Oxford, not African American. And we've been trying to figure that one out. Um, and again, it could be that maybe they've been living in family situations, extended families, and going to an Oxford house is just similar. Maybe the religious nature of some of the 12 step programs kind of makes it feel more comfortable. Um, but it's true. Um, people who are African-American stay longer in and have better outcomes. Doesn't mean that the others don't have good outcomes. Their outcomes are actually better. So if we can find a setting that's actually kind of helping those individuals who need this type of help, um, yeah, it, it really is uh, um, an important finding that we, we also want to try to understand a little better. Um, it, it's kind of popped out of several of our studies and we're still trying to figure that one out. Right. Now we've got just a few minutes left. I know we have two hands up. Let's um, see if we can get to both questions. Uh, Robbie, I'm not sure who had the hand up first, but Robbie, why don't you go first? Hey, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I just a point of reference that I, when, we, when, when um, you were talking about you moving, uh, people moving, like using and have to be put out, what, what we do in our structure is that if you go straight to some type of treatment, whether it's a, 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 a MICA unit or psych ward, a detox or rehab, like somewhere where you can be safe and then the house can vote to let you back in, we'll hold your bed for you. But if you go and say, well, I'll think about it. I want to go stay at my girlfriend's or I want to go stay in a hotel room. As soon as you leave the, then it's all bets are off the table. You cannot come back. You have to wait 30 days, reapply, do the whole thing again. So that's just kind of a way where it's like, hey, we want to encourage you to go to get help. And we're understanding the difference between recovery and treatment. Like that's just a platform, but the house is about recovery. Um, so thanks. Uh, and I, and I, about that 50% thing about why some people just don't seem to, I've noticed a pattern. There's some people that have, they self-sabotage. They'll do something almost subconsciously to break a house rule. So they'll get put out. So now they have an excuse to be the five-year-old again and go use. And that's what I've seen a couple of, I mean, swear to God, like it, it's bizarre. But I don't think they wake up unconscious and say, I'm going to sabotage today. But I think they consciously do something so they know they're going to get put out. They were told you have to be at the house meeting and they don't come to the house meeting. So now they're getting put out and now they go use. And then unfortunately, a couple of times, 
two days later, they were found dead in a hotel room. So I'd love to find out more people's opinion on what we can do about that percentage of that people that doesn't work for. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got one, just a couple of minutes. Um, Van, I think you had your hand up next. Uh, my apologies, I think this is gonna be the last question. I'm sorry, we're out of time, but Van, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so Dr. Kelly, thank you for acknowledging my hand. Um, my question was in regards to the data. How do we get access to that data that uh, Dr. Jason uh, presented here today? Because uh, I definitely like to be able to take a closer look. So, so we have kind of a website, leonardjason.com, um, and all our publications are um, available. And also ResearchGate um, is another vehicle that if people basically go on there, all our publications are in ResearchGate and we can make them available. And third, um, if you have a particular area that you want to um, get some research on, like for example, MATs or, or um, some of our studies with racial ethnic groups, um, just email me at ljason, L-J-A-S-O-N at depaul, D-E-P-A-U-L dot E-D-U. And I'm happy to correspond with you. Well, um, hey. Thank you. Um, thank you for great questions. Um, Lenny, thank you so much for bringing your expertise and experience um, to us today. It's just so, such a pleasure to, to have you um, uh, and your wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, thank you for that. I feel like we could go on definitely for another hour at least uh, with questions and discussion. Uh, such as it is, we have to end. But uh, I want to thank everybody for coming, for participating. Don't forget uh, opioidresponsenetwork.org, free consultation on any aspect of what we've talked about today, uh, as well as anything else related to opioid stimulant or other use disorders. Um, so uh, spread the word. It's free. Um, it's a free service and it's underutilized. So let people know. Um, Please tune in next time. Um, look out for the emails um, for on, or go to our website, recoveryanswers.org, to check out the next webinar, which will be coming up in a couple of months. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody.